Professor Jorge Mari has spoken elsewhere in this course about movies that imagine utopia. But I want to talk about something a little more disconcerting, science fiction's ability to put people in their place. When we say that we put someone in their place, we generally mean we've punctured their egos. A lot of SF stories are about such situations. Aliens invade and threaten our survival. A plague escapes from a weapons lab and threatens our survival. The Death Star moves into our solar system and threatens our survival. Our heroes have to deal with these blows to their feeling of invulnerability. But there's another sense in which SF puts people in their place, seeing humanity through the eyes of science. Science is not interested in ego deflation, but in dispassionate investigation. It desires to paint the bigger picture without any prejudice, pro or con. Science asks, where do we fit in the universe? Which leads me to the 10 million year view. Historians work by what we might call the 100 year or sometimes the 1000 year view. Over the course of a 1000 years of human history, things change. We can learn something about ourselves by looking at those changes. In the perspective of a thousand years, we see that the way things are now is not the way they were and may not be the way they will be. Anthropologists might be said to work by the 10,000 year view. From the perspective of 10,000 years, even the most long lasting of human civilizations seems impermanent and our political concerns evaporate like smoke. Evolutionary biology, geology, and physics are the home of the 10 million year view. As the SF writer Robert Silverberg once said, in the perspective of 10 million years, whom we will date this weekend seems rather unimportant. Unlike most fiction, which concentrates on the problems of individual people in the present, usually over a small period of a single lifetime, science fiction from its beginnings has used these larger perspectives. In The Time Machine, published in 1895, H.G. Wells sends his time traveler forward to the year 802,701. There he discovers that the human race has evolved into two species, the Eloi, who live lives of leisure on the surface of the earth, and the Morlocks, who live underground and supply the Eloi with the material goods that allow for their pleasure. In return, the Morlocks raise the Eloi as cattle and eat them. Wells was pointing out that evolution does not stop with the present, but he was also using the future as a way to send a warning to the upper classes of 1895. If the division of the wealthy and laboring classes is maintained indefinitely, humans will evolve into different species along these lines. The result will not be a happy one for the wealthy. So, if you don't want your descendants to end up as dinner for the descendants of your servants, you'd better let your daughter date that boyfriend who works in your factory. Applying the million-year view, the social conditions that seemed normal to his 1895 readers turn out to be a recipe for disaster. This is what science does. It pulls back from our brief moment to situate us in a larger perspective, to identify global trends and suggest what we can and cannot do about them. Science fiction, which is not science but may use science, puts this distant perspective, the thousand or 10,000 or 10 million year view, into the lives of individuals just like you and me. It turns an abstract observation about cosmic events into an engrossing drama about the survival of characters we care about. Since the advent of technological civilization, humans have increasingly had the ability to change the natural world. SF challenges readers to recognize that they are a part of the world, rather than standing outside of it and acting upon it. There are drawbacks to writing fiction from the 10 million year view. It's hard to tell a story that shows what's happening all over the planet at once, or that stretches over millennia, and still give characters we can follow. But when it works, it shows us things that no other kind of fiction can show. Which brings me to Kim Stanley Robinson's 2020 novel, The Ministry for the Future. Robinson is interested in the effects of historical change on people over long periods of time. He defines SF as a kind of historical fiction, with the clock turned forward instead of back. In an SF story, he says, the future we see must be connected to the present by some demonstrable sequence of possible events. Robinson works hard to give us characters to whom we may relate, while still covering vast amounts of time and space. 
For example, his Mars trilogy, Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars, shows us the terraforming of Mars, a process that takes hundreds of years. Robinson uses an SF trick to humanize this huge story. Life extension treatments are developed that allow his characters to live hundreds of years, and so we can see the changes that occur, however slowly, by following characters who live through them. The Ministry for the Future is about the fight against climate change, the global result of a couple hundred years of burning carbon that can't be undone in a moment. Here he covers only 30 or 40 years, but he faces the problem of showing us effects that occur all over the world, involving a multitude of actions and reactions. Robinson does this by splitting the point of view between two central characters, both committed to reversing climate change. Mary Murphy is a bureaucrat who heads the ministry of the book's title, a non-governmental agency set up in 2024 by the signatories of the Paris Climate Accord. Mary's job is to speak for our unborn descendants, who otherwise have no say in political decisions being made today. Frank May is a relief worker, traumatized by his first-hand experience of a massive heat wave in India that kills millions of people in a week. Frank becomes convinced that legal means will not overcome the inertia of the status quo. We get a close view of Mary and Frank, their personal lives, their public struggles. But two characters aren't enough to give the global view. So, into their stories, Robinson scatters first-person accounts from dozens of people all over the world, covering decades of the effort to reverse global warming. There are successes and setbacks, news reports, meeting notes, manifestos, definitions, and riddles. Robinson gives us a chapter from the viewpoint of migrating caribou. He even gives us one from the point of view of a carbon atom. Robinson has done his research into the science of climate change, but the power of his story comes from the human testimony of people going through their daily lives in the midst of a slow-moving crisis. These people, like you and me, live their lives day by day, but against the 10 million year view that hovers in the background. Through Mary, Robinson shows changes to society that must happen to reduce production of carbon dioxide. Mary tries legislation, public advocacy, and legal interventions. Robinson shows how hard it is to affect change in an economic system that cares more about the next corporate earnings report than about how livable the world will be in 50 years, especially when measures to quit burning carbon reduce profits and disrupt people's work and lives. The ministry proposes scientific interventions, geoengineering, pumping out water from below glaciers to slow their melting, or scattering aerosols in the upper atmosphere to reduce the greenhouse effect. That's one path. But more important are changes to global finance, such as introducing carbon coins, a cryptocurrency that allows people to make money by sequestering carbon instead of burning it. Frank, in contrast, represents what happens if we don't manage to deal with these problems governmentally. Because he's convinced that bureaucracies and bankers will not do the right thing, he turns to eco-terrorism. The Ministry for the Future deals with depressing, seemingly insurmountable realities, but it offers hope. By the end of the book, the corner has been turned, not to utopia, but to ways of living that save the Earth and the human race, which is inextricably a part of the Earth. Asia Murphy will talk elsewhere in the course about some of the solutions Robinson describes. E.O. Wilson has proposed half-Earth, the idea that humans should confine themselves to living on only one half of the Earth's surface, leaving the rest of the land to the wild. It would be all too easy to ask developing countries to bear the brunt of the sacrifices necessary to do this. Robinson suggests that these troubles will not be solved by unloading them onto the poor. The wealthy and powerful who think that they may escape from environmental disaster by refusing to engage with the problem will find that they can't. We create the future by our decisions. One person is so small that it may seem hopeless. But things got this way through group action and they may be altered through group action. We have already been doing geoengineering for 200 years without knowing it. Global warming arose from decisions made over a long period of time, and it can be reversed if individuals in large enough numbers work together over a long period of time. We live our lives in single days, months, years. 
It's our nature to focus on what's right in front of us. But if we can project our imaginations back into the distant past or into the distant future, we discover the thousand year, the 10,000 year, the million year view. From that vantage point, what seems to be the best action for the next day, month, or year may be the wrong one for the next decade, century, or millennium. Much science fiction presents fantasies of omnipotence in a universe of inexhaustible resources. But no matter what Star Wars or Star Trek may tell us, Kim Stanley Robinson reminds us that there is only one planet Earth, and it's up to us to preserve it. There is no Planet B.